Good afternoon. Uh, it's very nice to welcome each of you to this seminar session. Um, every uh, good seminar needs a text. So the text is a very famous quotation hanging on the wall of a Washington law firm which says, when in doubt, do the right thing. We'll talk a lot about that. When in doubt, do the right thing. A rather more serious non-gag text is uh, the famous line from de Tocqueville uh, to the effect that one mustn't confuse the familiar with the necessary. That means in English, the fact that we have done something or you have done something or I or, I or my institution in a particular way does not tell me that it should be done that way or should be done uh, in any other way. Every good uh, lecture not only needs a text, it needs a pedagogic theory. Professor Beiser, why do you answer every question with another question? To which the only legitimate answer is, why not? <laughs> and finally, uh, before we adjourn, every seminar needs a good um, role model. The role model for this seminar is the protagonist in Moliere's play, Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme, or known in English as Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme. <laughs> the protagonist, who's a boor, uh, is told that all of spoken English is either poetry or prose. So he bounces around on the stage with great pride because, you see, he has been speaking prose all these years and he didn't even know it. To be serious, you all, I all, have been doing social theory and political theory for a lot of years, and perhaps not as uh, self-reflectively uh, or as self-analytically as one might be. So uh, the ultimate educational task of the sessions uh, which are about to begin is to help us better to understand assumptions that we have made and to at least have some sense of some of the questions that one might want to ask are relevant to uh, the topics which will be presented. How many of you will admit to having been in Britain? Raise your hands, please. Hands down. They drive in Britain on the right or on the left? On the left. And in America, we drive on the right. Why do the British drive on the wrong side? <laughs> I mean, I was set up line. I just, why did the British drive on the wrong side? Uh, uh, we won the revolution. I'm sure that's... Uh, uh, what side do the Japanese drive on? I don't really know for sure. Uh, that's the right. And the Swedes, if anybody happens to know? Used to be on the left and now is on the right. Is there such a thing as the right side? Or have we begun now talking social theory? Um, is it a matter of indifference to you as to whether one drives on the right or on the left? For your next vacation, you wind up in Fiji. Uh, perhaps you've been. I, have, I honestly do not know. Does anybody know? Right, left? You come to Fiji, where you've rented a car from Hertz. It matters to you or it doesn't matter to you what they do in Fiji? It matters a great deal. You uh, wish that all Boston drivers cared as much as... Uh, it matters a great deal. But it's not the question of what's correct, is it? It's correct in Fiji, whatever it is that they do. It's correct in Japan, whatever it is that they do. It's correct uh, in here in the District of Columbia, whatever all you do. Um, the name of that legal, uh, well, how does one decide? How does one know? Well, you stop a police officer and you ask him. And he tells you. Uh, and you say, thank you. That is called legal positivism. Roughly translated, law is the command of the sovereign. Whoever it is that is constituted authority in Fiji tells you to drive on the right, drive on the left. As uh, the state legislature in whatever state you uh, perhaps came from makes a decision as to uh, in America how you drive uh, and so forth. Positivism, law is the command of the sovereign. If I wanted to be ostentatious, I would say see Austin. If I wanted to be a little more ostentatious, I would say see Thomas Hobbes. Law is the command of the sovereign. So you are driving around uh, somewhere on the beltway or whatever they call the freeways over here, and you look in your mirror, and there is an ugly-looking thing behind you with a red blinker on its top, and it's blinking uglily at you. So you pull over to the side, and this uh, state trooper gets out and inquires about how fast you are going. When you see him blinking, you pull over to the side or not? The next day, you are driving along at the same speed that this obnoxious uh, Smokey the Bear bothered you about, and you see on the uh, sidewalk a Cub Scout blowing a metal whistle and holding up his hand. You stop or not? 
Cub Scouts. Well, you've got nothing else to do but kibitz with a kid. You stop. He says to you, citizen driver, you were driving too fast. I don't know what you say, but you don't think he's a cute kid anymore? For Cub Scouts, you don't stop. Final case. The same trooper that uh, pulled you over the other time is on vacation in Las Vegas. And you are on vacation in Las Vegas. And this son of a gun takes his hat on vacation, and with the same hat and the same whistle, he pulls you over in Las Vegas. The first event occurred in Rhode Island. You're obliged to stop or not to stop? For a Rhode Island state trooper on vacation in uh, Las Vegas? Of no, of course not. Why not? He has no authority. He had authority yesterday. He had jurisdiction yesterday. You were in Rhode Island. He was the agent of the Rhode Island government as a Rhode Island state trooper. Why are we running this number? It runs again on the notion of positivism. Grandma is walking by the street with Mark Spitz, for example, the noted swimmer. They see a kid fall into a pool. Grandma says, Hark, we must save that kid. What kind of an answer to it is it that it's a Las Vegas kid and you're from Rhode Island, Grandma? Grandma, who perhaps didn't go to university, knows the answer to these questions better than I seem to know the answer to these questions. Grandmas know that what you're doing is you see a kid drowning in the pool, is you pull the kid out, or you call the police, or you throw the kid a rope, well, you, you do something, and we say, no, 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 Grandma, you don't understand. This is uh, Nevada. You don't have jurisdiction as a grandma. <laughs> what kind of jurisdiction is a grandma? She knows substantively what ought to be done. That child ought to be saved. As distinct from the earlier examples, and indeed the jurisdiction example of procedure, who has the authority to constitute rules in a particular society? I want to set out at the beginning of this uh, seminar series a distinction between legal positivism, which we have on the table, or philosophical positivism. Obligation comes from the command of the sovereign. And there's a great deal one would study there to know how that issue has been dealt with in different time frames. But that's beyond my scope right now. Law is the command of the sovereign as distinct from law is doing the right thing. Doing the right thing substantively, content-wise, we will talk about in the language of natural law or higher law. Just to give you some handles on that way of thinking. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That's uh, Thomas Jefferson borrowing from John Locke. The truths are ev evident. Evident to whom? Evident to all right-thinking uh, persons. Uh, white males in any event, but that's an historical aside which I'm not interested in this time. Self-evident, we hold these truths to be. So I give you Sir Isaac Newton, who created the Fig Newton. He also created, uh, he created the law of gravity. He was sitting under a tree and a fig fell or whatever fell out and bopped him, and he created the law of gravity? What did he do? What's the verb? He discovered, he identified the law of gravity. It was there before he was. The verb for the Isaac Newton case is discover. There are ancient and distinguished philosophical, religious, political traditions that think about human rights in those terms. Discover. Plato, in the dialogues, talks about universals. He thinks he's speaking to an audience at different times and at different places. Plato. The Roman Catholic notion of the canon law, the traditions of the church, canon law, is another example, simply to give you hats uh, to hang, uh, hooks to hang a hat on, of uh, a higher law tradition which is deserving of your respect, and then they will vary as to the nature of the religious tradition, maybe because of revelation, maybe because of human reason, but the content is the right thing. Uh, as distinguished from the early, as, as I'm giving it, the earlier view of positivism, positivism. So we have a notion of law or authority or rights. Would you say rights exist in a society which has created those rights? And uh, an alternative view which says rights come, for example, from scripture or from revelation or from religious tradition uh, or from human common understanding or lots of things. But they are there waiting to be discovered, not to be created. Even in Rhode Island, no one thinks, I think, no one thinks that the legislature could repeal the law of gravity, even though uh, perhaps uh, one doesn't 
necessarily know. I teach these issues in another setting by means of a lifeboat case. There are several famous lifeboat cases in the, li in the literature. The one that I teach is named Holmes, uh, not, no relation at all to Justice Holmes. There was a sailor named Holmes, and there was a desire. This, I think, becomes the basis of Melville's Billy Budd. But in a literature class, they will know that. Um, so the ship goes down in the middle of the ocean, and all kinds of things happen. And at a certain point, they're in the lifeboat, and Holmes, who is an admirable sailor, everyone agrees that he, uh, he uh, followed the rules about all women were to be saved first. That we will discuss another time. The rule that all women are to be saved first, that children would not be separated from their parents, husbands from He did all these great stuff at great risk to his life, and then there came a point where he said, you know, this, this boat, they were in a, uh, whatever, a long boat, a uh, lifeboat, a lifeboat, uh, is going to sink. We're all going to die. So they began throwing people overboard, and he did the throwing. A lot to say about that case. Why is it interesting that that case occurred in a boat? And why is it interesting that it was in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean? as distinct from uh, on the Hudson River, for example. Why does it matter? Yeah. It wasn't in anybody's country. It was in the middle. It wasn't in anybody's country. He was prosecuted and indeed sent to jail by the federal government for, I think, six months beyond time that he had previously served when they got their hands on him. You might want to think about that. Law is the command of the sovereign, but there's no sovereign there. And it sounds like, at least in the 19th century, people were willing to punish uh, this uh, young seaman for what he had done. He had done the wrong thing. Um, as long as the following shot is not photographing the audience, that's OK. How many of you will admit that you know how to play poker? All right. As a theoretical exercise, I mean, knowing how to play poker. Are deuces wild in poker, yes or no? Yes, it depends, can be sometimes. Well, I have an excellent way to play poker. You deal, and I will decide on the wild cards after I see my hand. Can't do that. Can't do that. Why not? Procedural regularity. The constitutional example of that probably would be an ex, part, an ex post facto law, after the fact. All right? Is it inherent or, intri or uh, intrinsic that twos, deuces, either are or are not wild? Now, nah. what, what are the rules of the game? I just answered my own question. What are the rules of the game? The rules are whatever they all agreed to, right? Can you play one-eyed jacks a while? I mean, little kids can play three sixes and nines a while. It may not be a very interesting game, because everyone will have four aces on every deal. But you, what's in... Whatever people... You hear how that's positivism? Whatever people agree to is the rule of that game. Deuces are or are not wild. Not because one can get a principle out of Plato, or a principle out of Augustine, or a principle out of the Talmud, not for any of those reasons, but because it was agreed by the players before they put their money on the table that uh, deuces would be wild, or deuces would not be wild. A positivist approach to these issues will be very interested in procedure, in procedural regularity. It will bring forth examples like how would you like to drive your car in a state where the sign said, drive at any speed that the next officer who stops you will consider interesting? Uh, help me with the authorship of uh, Guys and Dolls. We're old enough. I'm sorry? Lesser and Low, one of those? Uh, Damon Runyon, uh, Guys and Dolls, Guys and Dolls. Great play, I think. Um, so there's going to be this dice game. There's this guy, uh, our hero is not called, I think, Nathan Detroit, and he's a gambler and a hustler. And the rich fat cat comes into town, beat Julie. Nathan Detroit is running the song, though, something like the oldest reliable permanent floating crap game in New York. So he's running this dice game, and Big Julie is losing. After a while, Big Julie, who is a big thug, produces his own dice and says, we will play with my dice. Nathan Detroit says, there are no spots on those dice. Big Julie says, of course not. You roll them, and I'll call them. So you can write the rest of these scenes by yourselves. They play for $10,000, and Nathan Detroit loses. They play for $5,000, and Nathan Detroit loses. 
Big Julie says, now we will bet one dollar. He rolls the dice, and Nathan Detroit wins. And uh, there are no spots on the dice. Procedural regularity. Locke. John Locke. Known promulgated laws. You have to be able to know what the law is. You have to have a way to find out what the law is. I'll tell you how I find out what the law is. I ask my soul. Never mind your soul. Never mind your conscience. Never mind your grandma. You have to find a way authoritatively to know what the law is. Because the law is largely understood in terms of procedure and regularity. And knowing what it is that is considered in a particular place to be right or to be wrong, as on the driving example. And if you think that this discussion is trivial so far, consider Auschwitz. Suppose it turned out after the Germans lost World War II. Suppose it turned out that you had Eichmann or any of them in prison, and he answered you and said, everything I did was legal under the law of Germany. Everything I did was legal under the positive law in the society in which I lived. What do you want from me? I obeyed the law. To which we could say to him, we won the war in the hell with you. But we don't say that. We talk a language of international human rights. And we had the Nuremberg principles and the Nuremberg treaties. And we have all of the, maybe later we'll talk about this some more. Is the objection to Eichmann that anybody's grandmother would have known he was a pig? Or uh, is the objection to Eichmann different or not? Uh, where do rights come from? How to think about rights? Rights as the creature of a particular society, rights as the creature of, if that's even the appropriate word, God or religion or tradition or expectations or stuff like that. <laughs> Let me uh, give you some more modern examples to show you this uh, way of thinking about rights. So one of the great cases of American television this year has been the case of Griswold versus Connecticut in the 1960s, maybe 1966. Griswold versus Connecticut is the first case in the federal United States Supreme Court which establishes a uh, constitutional right to privacy, it is, which is why it's been in the press in recent, uh, recent years. The particular fact issue had to do with contraception. Contraception by the use of contraceptives by married couples. Uh, one of the defendants was a medical doctor on the Yale New Haven faculty who had prescribed and there was a statute in Connecticut which prevented or prohibited uh, a whole range of things relevant to, uh, to contraception. And in the United States Supreme Court, which couldn't remotely produce a, uni a unanimous opinion, I think there was no majority opinion, I may be wrong about that, there, in a fractured United States Supreme Court, there, was, there were established the federal right to, uh, to privacy. Notice what I just said without even thinking about it. What verb did I use? Established. Ah. In any event, after the case, it was agreed that there was a right to privacy, even though it was not at all agreed where this came from or how far it went. Um, this right to privacy is extremely significant for contemporary, and I mean this straight, is really important because one of the leading cases growing out of that is Roe versus Wade, abortion. Abortion. Maybe a few words about that later. Um, so Supreme Court splits badly on this issue of uh, is there a constitutional right to privacy such that it would can include the contraception by a married couple. There is an opinion by Justice Black which essentially takes the positivist approach. Justice Black says, we will have time enough to decide that there is or is not a federal privacy issue here when the legislature passes an appropriate statute. Congress hasn't spoken yet. Well, it's in the Constitution, Justice Black. He can't find it in the Constitution. It ain't in the text. That's in the sense in which I'm using him as a positivist. He goes to the text and he can't find it in the text or in authoritative, uh, at, to that date, authoritative interpretation of the text. That's just as black. A second very different opinion is presented by Justice Douglas. Justice Douglas writes an opinion which, uh, well, upholding the right to privacy. Uh, and he gives a constitutional argument, which I'm not interested in right now, but then at the end of all of that he says, marriage is a coming together for better or for worse. Marriage is older than, our, than the Bill of Rights, older than our political parties, older than the Constitution. And then he goes on and says it's protected. That's a higher law approach, as I have been using language this afternoon. 
there was a privacy right in marriage before there was the Bill of Rights, before there were political parties, before there was a written constitution. Black gets apoplectic in his reply to Douglas. How are we going to know what it is? There's the standard argument against natural law. It's subjective. It's subjective. How will you know? You'll be like the guy with the dice with no spots. How will you know? It has to be text-based, thus the positivists. Douglas, marriage is, is and is. I tell my students that the most interesting word in that opinion is the word is, for reasons which I want to come back to uh, either in this lecture or the next one. You've got black, it's got to be rooted in the text. I'm calling that positivism. You've got Douglas, it's an old tradition or something like that. Marriage has existed before that, as described. And then you've got a inter very interesting, not too often noted opinion by Mr. Justice Goldberg, which talks about institutions, values, norms, which are rooted in the particular traditions of a particular society. Douglas, in so many words, says, I don't have to talk about whether privacy in marriage is or is not observed in Britain, is or is not observed the way we understand it or want to understand it in Japan, is or is not a hundred years ago. All I'm saying now is, given this society that I just, so to say, Justice Goldberg, I'm serving as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, I can say to you that privacy in marital relations is in this society, I think his exact word is deeply rooted, deeply rooted in the traditions of our society to which Black also responds and says, we have no Gallup poll to help us understand which traditions are deeply rooted in the society and which traditions are not deeply rooted in the society. Right to privacy, talked about, as I'm using the name Black as a positivist, it's not in the text, the legislature hasn't spoken, the constitutional fathers didn't speak. Douglas, some sort of higher law, general law, natural law, it was there before there was a political government called the United States of America. And Goldberg saying, deeply rooted in our traditions, in our society. Thus avoiding issues uh, as, for example, of other countries, or if one were to go to study in another country, and so on, and so forth. The nature of rights. A couple of uh, general characteristics about the uh, general comments about rights in the United States. Number one, and I have proved the point today, not a point that I proudly want to prove, one of the characteristic of discussions of rights in the United States is that they are overwhelmingly law-based. And it'd be interesting to know why that was and what the implications of that are, but you begin talking about censorship and someone is gonna say the First Amendment free speech. I tell my kid to move the dishes and he talks about the First Amendment and doesn't move the dishes, but that's another issue. Um, our discussions of uh, rights overwhelmingly in the modern period in, involve discussions of the law and the Constitution and things of that sort. Number two, the theory that underlies our constitutional rights is very substantially a negative theory. That is to say, which is hardly surprising given what was written in the 18th century. The fundamental notion of civil rights that informed this country at least for 100 years was the notion that if we get government out of the way, people will be free. Right means I can do it and they won't stop me, they won't interfere. I can publish criticism of the president, I can go to a church of my choice, I can uh, urge you to demonstrate on behalf of whatever I urge you to demonstrate, the right to assemble peaceably. The notion of right tied in with all of those has to do with a negative conception of, the, of, of what rights are. Rights are when, there's, when the government is not stopping me. There are two aspects to that that are worth noting at the beginning. One aspect to note is the emphasis on the government. And given the context of the revolution with Britain, well, it's, it's obvious as to why that should be. Do you happen to remember the first word of the first amendment of the Bill of Rights? Not wrong, uh, wrong document. Wrong. Congress. The first word in the Bill of Rights is Congress shall make no law, speech, press, uh, assembly, religion. And later, that has been extended to the states through the 14th Amendment, which says quite explicitly, no state shall deny. The view then, when those texts were written, was that uh, primary limitations on liberty, on rights, come from the government. It's the sheriff who tries to stop you from publishing. 
It's the sheriff who tries to stop you from praying in a non-conforming church. It's the sheriff who, etc. For your honest consideration, does that make sense in 1991? At a town meeting, which is the model of a lot of this we'll get to, at a town meeting, if the bank president is sitting there quietly listening to all of us protest, and word comes down, he's going to pull the loans if we don't shut up. That's not the government. That's not the government. Who has more power over my life? General Motors, if I work for them? Uh, or the sheriff? Or do they have comparable kinds of power? There is a radical public-private distinction in much of our discussions of rights. And a question to pose, to think about, is whether the public-private distinction makes sense. Will it stand up uh, as a distinction? Closely related is the notion of negative. Congress shall make no law restricting. What would it look like differently? A trivial example, uh, which I understand still to be true. If I want to write a letter to my senator, I have a constitutional right to do that. What do I have to do to the envelope? 29 cents. If I lived in Canada and what was a citizen there and wanted to write to my member of parliament, that goes free. Now, the people in the seminar are not going to get exercised about 29 cents postage. But think about it as, as a notion, as, an, as a, an illustration of uh, the right to petition. Write to counsel. Important. Write to counsel. Quite clear as to what it meant when it started out its uh, history. It meant if you could afford a lawyer, they couldn't stop you from bringing him. That grew out of a very specific historical experience under the British uh, period of government in which lawyers were not permitted to be brought, particularly in significant cases, because they would screw it up for the prosecution or something roughly like that. If you have a lawyer, you can bring him. You know how in Gideon and Wainwright the Supreme Court has moved us. You are entitled to be given a lawyer. I have a wonderful idea for the people in this room. What New York City needs is another daily newspaper. And since there's freedom of the press in America, the government won't stop us. All we need to open up that newspaper is hardworking folks like you and $25 million? I don't know. I don't know. Which of the current restrictions on freedom of the press in our lifetimes, and as one thinks about them, which of the current restrictions on freedom of the press have to do with the sheriff, the government intervening, and how many of them have to do with other, other interventions by the so-called private sector? If General Motors calls uh, the, the Detroit, whatever the newspaper is called there, and says, you can run any story you want to run, but if you run that story, we pull all our advertising, that's not a constitutional violation in the usual sense of the term. It may have tremendous clout, but it's not a constitutional violation in the usual sense of the term. So we're noticing the, a preoccupation with law as the discussion, discussion of rights goes forward. We're noticing the notion of a negative conception of rights. Get government out of the way. The Soviet Constitution of 1920-something or other, uh, as I read it translated into English, has provisions that look remarkably like our Bill of Rights. I don't for a minute suggest that that's what happened in Russia, but the document is interesting. The rights of the workers and their organizations to publish will be guaranteed by giving them free stocks of paper and access to the printing presses. Freedom of the press could mean every one of us gets once a year 10 column inches in the New York Times. Write what you want. Or it could mean if now, the New York Times interviews me and I use uh, uh, words that we would call swear words or I, I criticize the president or I criticize whatever, and the government wants to stop them from printing, then there's a big free speech issue, a freedom of the press issue. I'm reasonably interchangeable on those and perhaps shouldn't be. But it's not a restriction of anything. If the newspaper says, uh, we're, not, uh, we're not ever going to take an advertisement of anything you ever do, Pfizer, because we think you're a kook. Huh? To, uh, all right. Some more basic uh, issues to be taken into account of with respect to discussions of uh, freedoms. One notion to be taken care of early on is the notion of that we're going we're to talk about confrontational situations. 
One notion to be taken care of early on is the notion of the heckler's veto. As you all know, the, perhaps the most common jargon phrase in the issue of how far does freedom go, speech press, clear and present danger rule. The homes in um, Schenck, Justice Homes, no connection to the lifeboat homes, Justice Homes, falsely shouting fire in a crowded theater, falsely, sh cr falsely shouting crowded, fi sh crowded fire, yeah, falsely shouting fire in a crowded, you lose. Why do you lose? Because we do a trade-off. People can get sta stomped on, people can get trampled, people will storm the exits and stuff like that. It will be dreadful. Easily, easily done. Well, if a guy gets up to make a speech and we find it grossly offensive and we stand there and scream at him and throw uh, tomatoes and potatoes at him, not for his dinner, uh, we throw things at him, etc., etc., and the police come to stop us, we can say, look, here is the crowd. And there is this nut talking about socialism or about religion or about politics or about whatever, and we are truly offended, and we are going to throw stones at him, and boy, is there a danger. The heckler's veto, the notion that the audience can't shut up the speaker and then get the help of the police in doing it. The social obligation, the political obligation to protect us when we try to express uh, our dissenting uh, or critiquing opinions. Uh, thus, the, uh, the heckler's veto. Another point which sounds like a preliminary point but will get very important as we move along a bit. Uh, some years ago, the Nazi party wanted to march in Skokie, Illinois. Why Skokie, Illinois? Both correct, because uh, it has a significant Jewish population and included in that population are a large number of actual survivors of the death camps of the Holocaust under Hitler, and which is why the Nazis wanted to march there for the public relations value of... Uh, of the occasion, ultimately held by a federal judge that they were entitled to do that. Suppose the Nazis wanted to have a march down Interstate 95 at the height of the traffic jam. Do you have an intuition that that's the same or different than the other Nazi case? Clearly so. Why? I mean, they may impede traffic the other way. Which way? More people involved. Uh, that sort of sounds like the Nazis can make a speech only if they don't bother us, or you alternatively might mean don't bother us too much, or something roughly like that. Relevant to the discussion or not relevant that the Girl Scouts had recently had a parade in Skokie? We would, in the present jurisprudential mode, take that as evidence that if the Girl Scouts and the veterans of foreign wars and the Friends of Brown University and other great institutions were uh, permitted to march down the, the uh, mall or the main street, I don't know Skokie at all, down Main Street, Skokie, Illinois, then we would say the government has no right to stop the Communist Party or the Socialist Party or the Nazi Party from marching in the same place. Why not? And how different from Interstate 95? The government will say no one is permitted to have a parade down Interstate 95. Content neutral, okay? The government is neutral as to the message of the group, whether it's for Nazism or whether it's the Girl Scouts who want to sell their cookies or whether it's whatever it is, the veterans who want to assert themselves on Veterans Day, whatever it is. Content neutral. No one is allowed to march down Interstate 95, but some number of other people have been allowed to march down Interstate 95. Therefore, the government is, we would say, subjectively or potentially subjectively limiting persons' freedoms and ought not be permitted to do so. There are lots of examples that you will know about upon a little reflection that have to do with limitations on speech which we can, or other freedoms which we can tolerate easily uh, because of the notion of there's no discretion, it's content neutral. Um, I don't know if, uh, I was going to run a really clever example about uh, speaking in the operating room of a hospital and you know what the answer is. No one is allowed to speak in the hospital, so therefore the people who want to sell socialized medicine are not allowed to speak in the operating room of the hospital either. And then at home in the university, I was going to say to my students something like, uh, if someone wants to make a speech advocating anything at 4.30 in the morning under your dorm window. That they consider to be plausible. 4.30? Is it Saturday night? Is there? But hit them with uh, 7.30 in the morning, and there is a uniform understanding that uh, no one is allowed to make a speech under your window at 7.30 in the morning 
whether they are urging you to uh, protect ecology, or whether they are uh, urging you to be kind to animals, or whether they are urging you to send Mother's Day, or whether the government has it, what the government will call a content-neutral rule that nobody may make speech at between the hours of X uh, and Y, and we're not as worried about subjectivity, and we're not as worried uh, about discretion by public officialdom in that context. Uh, all right, also on the preliminary notions of, uh, of uh, speech, but of rights and of the nature of rights, and how they uh, conflict. What I want to do in the uh, remaining time of this session, or much of the remaining time, is teach you all of important social theory in the last two centuries. But you are a bright audience, so uh, you may not need the remaining time. I want to show off by pegging the discussion on the language or the names of John Locke and Karl Marx. Just to get you to, uh, again, to be thinking forward uh, after this particular session. John Locke is indeed the source of Jefferson's quotation. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created, all men are endowed by their creator, and so on and so on. And among these are life, liberty, and not Locke, property, but Jefferson, pursuit of happiness. Good, good. We're going to label that approach an idealist approach. We're going to label it that way because Marx calls it an idealist approach in a distinction between an idealist view of politics and a materialist. Idealism versus materialism. Not idealism in the, in the sense of uh, Joan of Arc was a wonderful idealist I, uh, or did great things, not in that sense. Idealist in the sense of what was central to Locke's writing was the careful explication of ideas. The reali so that if you put to Locke the question, what changes? He would, for example, talk about changes in, in the world of ideas, in the realm of ideology, in the realm of belief patterns, in the realm of belief systems. That's where the political action was at, ideas. Marx, uh, who is perhaps less familiar to us, and again, obviously, uh, I'm doing all of it on one foot in three minutes. Marx articulates prominently a materialist point of view. I need to get a little better understanding of what a materialist point of view is to see how it ties in with the other things discussed uh, thus far this afternoon. Um, uh, I say to my students, look out the window at the trees. They look out the window at the trees. They, I say, what's happening to the leaves? They say, the leaves are red and yellow. Well, they are going to fall. Ah, says I, dear student, when did the trees get together and have a meeting such that they should, had they voted to shed their leaves? Ha, ha, ha. Does anybody know why they do shed their leaves? Well, this is uh, Brown University. There are no distribution requirements, so of course they don't know. Uh, I don't know either, uh, but I'll tell you what I tell them. I say to them, has any of you ever seen a uh, snap frost, an uh, earlier than expected frost? And snow, ice storm or snowstorm. Yeah, they've, some of them from Vermont have seen that. What happens to the trees? Well, the trees are all weighted down by the snow or the ice storm. And they break their branches. Oh. That's a materialist explanation of a particular scientific phenomenon. I may be totally wrong botanically. But what I'm looking for is an understanding materially of how it is that the trees work in a certain way. I say to the same students, how many of you have ever been to Florida? They've all been to Florida. I don't bother them with driving on the right or left right now. I draw a palm tree with these humongous green leaves. Says I to them, these humongous green leaves look lovely. We will bring them back up north to Brown University and plant them on the green. And they say to me, no, no, dear professor, they will all die in the winter. They don't die in Florida. The conditions are different. We'll talk to them. We'll get them therapeutic. I mean, I can drag out the example as long as your good tolerance will allow me. That is a materialist explanation. There are trees in Vermont that are green after it snows. That don't lose their leaves. They don't have leaves. They have... And they got a shape. Can you picture that shape? Yeah, the snow can go drooping right off the end. That's exactly right. So, how did they build houses in Amsterdam in the 17th century? What kind of roofs? Evergreen. That's right. That's exactly right. And if you've ever been to San Diego, or uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, perhaps better, and you see the lovely Hacienda styles, flat. Why did they do it? They did it because of the material conditions under which they lived, whether they were conscious of it or were not conscious of it. 
I mean, if in the 17th century a school kid had drawn a house, I assume all of this, uh, in uh, her art class in Amsterdam, and it said the new, these big storky roofs are where the storks can come in, are horrible, and we should have roofs like this. They would have thought she was a deviant. They would have developed, Marx says, a, a theory of aesthetics or of architecture, but he also talks about religion and culture and politics, all of which would have been, for Marx, for Marx, not necessarily us, but for Marx, would have had to do with the response to material conditions uh, which are the underlying, uh, the dominant underlying concern in a Marxist analysis. You look at the houses in Amsterdam like this, you're supposed to see response to material conditions. You will look to the, the adobe Spanish style with flat roofs in Santa Fe. They had a different set of materials available to them. Doesn't sound very controversial. Why, incidentally, what changes? I have myself seen flat roofs in the north. People change their ideas about what would be beautiful, to which Marx would say, nonsense. Why, yeah, technology changed. We got reinforced concrete. We have air conditioning. That's why we got the rust belt and the sun belt, because we got air conditioning, and all those guys can work in factories where they couldn't work before there was air conditioning, and all those mills moved out of Massachusetts and Rhode Island and stuff like that. That's a materialist explanation eh? for you to think about. Rights as you understand them, rights as you understand them, how comfortable are you with the notion that they are intrinsically worthy of attention because of the important values they connote, the important ideas in their traditions? And how many of them are you prepared to say are to be understood as a particular result of particular, you could say economic, you could say social, you could say political conditions at a particular point in time? We hold these truths to be self-evident for Locke was proof of their vitality and their importance. We hold these truths to be self-evident, and his audience, he thought, would agree with him, and Locke then makes an extensive argument in his text as to why that should be. We hold these truths to be self-evident for Marx. Is it self-evidence of what? It is evidence of a kind of ideological blindness to the material reality that is making those, uh, making it so obvious to you that it is ugly this way or not ugly that way, uh, that the roofs can be built this way or not be built that way. One is not critical, one is not aware, one is not self-conscious. And Marx doesn't expect us to understand Marx because by, def by his definitions, we who can come to such a seminar as this are in a position which uh, makes it contrary to our own economic and social positions to recognize those truths which are obvious to you about nature, which are obvious to you about nature, okay? Thus Marx, thus Locke uh, on ideology. When you come to visit us in Rhode Island, uh, we will take you to Slater Mill. Does anyone know who Slater Mill is? Well, who Slater was? I'm sorry? Yeah, Slater probably stole the secrets of building a certain kind of machinery from the Brits as a young man came over to the United States and established in what is now Pawtucket, Rhode Island, a uh, mill. He put it, by the way, alongside the water of the river, where there are sort of rapids. You think he did it because he liked the view? That was his technology, right? He had a water wheel, and that's how he did it. That doesn't sound very risque either. When you come to this tour, which is very well done and very nicely done, when you come to the tour of, and I get no percentage of these tickets, uh, when you come to Slater's Mill, they will show you, before they show you his mill, they will show you how things used to be done before that. And how things used to be done before that was hand spinning on a kind of a wheel. And they have a guide there dressed in a period costume. And she lets the little children handle some of the wool. And then they, whatever you call all that stuff, because uh, we are the generation of polyesters. But um, they card it, and they do this stuff to this. And then, then it goes on the spinning wheel. And they let the little kids go back and forth to the spinning wheel. And it breaks. It's, you, you really have to develop skill beyond Nintendo in order to turn this stuff into cloth, and uh, it breaks, and um, so, says the guide, develops the tradition that one of the daughters stays home and never marries because her family needs her. What do you call that daughter? Spinster. Spinster. I don't think that's a gag. That is a materialist explanation 
That is a materialist explanation of a particular set of social relationships in which fathers determine whom their daughters marry or whether their daughters marry or under what circumstances they may leave home. A spinster, because they needed her to spin. What changed? Technology changed. Now they need her to leave home in the little family farm and go live in a town where she can work in a, car, in a factory. And she can sit at a bench X hours a day doing one transaction uh, with the bench uh, X hours in the day. Um, it seems obvious to talk about spinning wheels that way. Is it obvious to talk about rights that way? The father had a right to determine who her, his daughter would marry. I mentioned Griswold in Connecticut a little earlier, the privacy case, and I said we would come back to Justice Douglas. Marriage is. Marriage is. Why is that word is the most interesting word in the uh, paragraph? Marriage, dearest class, means... Uh, a marriage means uh, unchangeable forever, or marriage includes divorce? Which one is really marriage? With a possibility to get out or no possibility to get out? Which one is marriage? Hmm? Depends on the society, the oldest student says. Depends on the society. Marriage is one at a time, or can I have three wives? Marriage is my love loves me and I love my love, or marriage is children can't be trusted to make these important decisions so the parents aided by the matchmaker make these important decisions. See Fiddler. Which one is really marriage? Marriage is my property gets split 50-50 if she divorces me? Or not? I can go all afternoon with marriage is. Uh, but we won't go all afternoon with marriage is. We will pick up in just a moment with marriage is, and we will also pick up with Santa Claus. So I encourage you in the break to think about Santa Claus. Thank you for your attention.